Hi, everyone. I'm Kathy, host of Living in Santa Barbara. And today I have an amazing guest with me, Jeremy Tesmer from Sullivan Goss Gallery. I've always admired this gallery, even though I haven't had much time to explore galleries myself. But every time I step into Sullivan Goss, it reminds me why I love art and how it connects us all. As someone who values storytelling, the world of art offers so much to explore and reflect upon. In this episode, Jeremy and I dive into Santa Barbara's art scene, and he shares the story behind the gallery and how it plays a role in building community. I know you're going to enjoy this one. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy Tesmer. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So, you know, I've always admired Sullivan Goss. I am i don't really go to a lot of art galleries. I've been really busy raising my son, but I do enjoy art and I know what I like. Yeah, that's what people come in and say. And one of our jobs is to help them develop some vocabulary. Um you were talking about making food for your son when we met this morning, and I'm sure you have a lot of words for food and cuisine, mm -hmm. and so you can speak about kind of precisely what you like. Most people know a few art words, and so we try and give them some language to put to the experience that they're having. Do they like it or not is the beginning. But, you know, if you if you didn't like the dish and I was trying to make it better, how would I do that without get you having, well, it's too spicy, but you don't know the word spicy. So how do we communicate that? It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the gallery. So Sullivan Goss is in its 40th year. Mm -hmm. This year we're going to have an exhibition that mounts later this week celebrating 40 years in business. What and day is that? Uh, it opens Friday. Okay. So the reception is first Thursday in October, and first Thursday is when all of the art galleries and venues that wish to participate in the life of culture in downtown Santa Barbara stay open late. So the first Thursday of the month. And Sullivan Goss has a very substantially sized space. You were in it recently. And so we tend to be ground zero just because it's a place where people can meet indoors and be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, so Sullivan Goss came here in 1993. It was started in Sierra Madre and Pasadena area. Okay. And is that where the owner's from? Yeah, the, 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 People who mentored all of us were Frank Goss and his wife, Patricia Sullivan Goss. Mm -hmm. And Patricia started the gallery in 1984. Frank was an environmental engineer. Was he an art aficionado at the time? Yeah, he he actually loved to tell the story, and it's a good one for explaining the human side of the world, his dad was a rocket engineer. And so he moved around to all the places in America where we build rockets, mm -hmm. Chicago and Pasadena and New Mexico. And Frank always said, my dad never commented on a work of art my whole life. And when they lived in Chicago, his mother loved that side of the human experience. And she would take them all to the Art Institute of Chicago, and she would give them a little bit of money, and they could buy a postcard in mm -hmm. the bookshop. And she would talk to them about why they picked what they picked. Mm -hmm. So that's a lovely way to get started in the art world. Um, Frank was going to be a priest, and okay. so he, <laughs> he studied comparative ancient literature, as one would, I guess, to be a priest. I, I don't know. And... Well, that's the humanities, which is a little bit related, yeah? For sure. And actually, the only person on our staff who has an art history degree is my colleague, Susan Bush. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. The rest of us are, you know, we have all different kinds of backgrounds, but she's the only one who has that formal education. Patricia Sullivan Goss, the founder of the gallery, also had an art history degree. Mm -hmm. Anyway, when Frank retired, he he. Yeah, it was a very stressful job, and he would come into the gallery sometimes just to relax and chat people up. He's a very gregarious, outgoing, lovely man. I mean, like a priest. Yeah, so this is it was his wife's business, and he would come hang out. 
Yep. Okay. And he would sit in. And when they moved to Santa Barbara, they started Sullivan Goss in the Arts and Letters Cafe. It opened at 7 East Anapamu Street in 1994. So they had a, a cafe and they had a bookstore and there was a little bit of a gallery component in it. And it was sort of modeled on Frank's mentor, in a sense, was a guy named Jake Zeitlin. And Jake was this character from Los Angeles. He was a poet uh, from Texas. And he realized there was no way he was going to make a living in Texas as a poet. So he moved to Los Angeles and he, he opened a bookstore and it became a bookstore gallery and it became kind of the seat of culture in Los Angeles. I think that's what Frank wanted to create. Mm-hmm. What was the bookstore out of curiosity? It was called Zeitlin and Verbrugge. And if you Google it, it's a place that's got some important, there's, there's some important things that happen. And eventually... Jake became a rare book dealer of note and ended up selling books from the 1500s to the Getty Museum for like a million dollars. So he actually retired with money as a book dealer, which is very unusual. Wow. Okay. So anyway, so that's that's kind of the story of Sullivan Goss. It, it, it started and um, I was hired in 2002 and all kinds of Poets and recording artists and, you know, old Hollywood and the people who ran the city, the lawyers and the administrators would come in. And so. So it mostly it was mostly a cafe with kind of a artistic component to it. It wasn't the space next door. It was just arts and letters. So the space that you're in is it that you've been in is 11 East Annapamu. And it's a very different space because that space, we took it over in 2006. And we had both buildings for a long time, but that was built from the ground up to be a gallery, mm-hmm. so to speak. I mean, it was it's an old building, so it was retrofitted from the ground up to be an art gallery. The space at 7 East Annapamu converted bit by bit from bookstore to gallery. So we had all these niches in mm-hmm. the walls that used to contain um, bookcases. And then we just ripped the bookcases out. And then we had these little funny little spaces where we could hang paintings. And gradually the books, the books diminished because of Amazon and Borders mm-hmm. and Barnes and Noble. And we got into the pure art business in 2004. Mm-hmm. And so that's only 20 years. Ago. That's only 20 years ago. And so I was there for that event. You started in 2004, is that what you said? I started in 2002. So okay. I, I, you know, I had to count the books every year. We had 12,000 books on art and architecture. Mm-hmm. And we had paintings in part of the gallery. And the longer money was in the paintings because... If you sell a painting for $3,000, you know, okay, if an art book is, let's say, $60, you got to sell 50 books Mm -hmm. just for one painting. Mm -hmm. Books do sell faster than paintings, but not so much faster that you don't make more money, I guess, in Mm -hmm. the art business. So anyway, we had this wonderful spot where it was full of books on art and architecture and wonderful food and art on the walls. And I met everybody in town. And Frank was very conscientious about introducing me and my colleague Susan and Nathan to everybody, mayors, and it was wonderful education in the life of Santa Barbara. Mm-hmm. Do you, now, uh, where did you come from? How did you get that job? Blind luck. So, what were you doing? What were you doing before? So, I. I am of the age where computers were part of my childhood, Mm -hmm. but barely. I think I got my first computer when I was 11 years old. And so by the time the internet went online in 1994, I had been on a computer for quite a while. Mm -hmm. My friends and I would play around with the early internet with bulletin board systems. And in college, I started building web pages and then websites and CSB. Yeah. Okay. And eventually I, I 
started a business designing websites and other kinds of you know graphic design collateral mm -hmm. the funny thing is is it was all ex that was also blind luck and an accident i was very interested in the humanities mm -hmm. and everyone was telling me there is no money you will starve if you pursue this life have you always been observant maybe okay yeah i i, I mean i i think i have a writer's viewpoint on the world mm -hmm. and i also think i'm a bit of a visual hedonist so one of the nice things about being in the art world is i can stare at a painting and nobody thinks it's weird mm -hmm. but i i do if i'm not staring at people i mean i do i'm i like to look at things for a long time so maybe that's yeah. to your point anyway so i was doing that job and i did it for quite you know did built web pages and did all kinds of graphics for things for people. And eventually the whole industry sort of professionalized. I got into it so early that anybody with hustle and a brain could kind of make it. And then gradually we started to turn out very serious people who had art backgrounds and computer science backgrounds. And at that point I realized I am working all the time. Wait, so how does computer science and art, like what's the connection? Well, because I really had more of a history, philosophy, political science, French and literature background, that was those were the things that I was really taken by mm -hmm. in high school and early on in college. When I started to do graphic design and websites for people, I didn't know anything about visual design. And so I was buying a lot of art books just to steal color palettes and steal compositional ideas. I was oh, okay. teaching myself and my wife was going through UCSB as an art history minor and I was actually reading all of her books as she was completing her process. So when I was interviewed by Frank, he wanted a computer person. Mm-hmm. For cataloging? Or exactly. For website? Okay. For the both. Um, he thought... Well, they're doing all this construction on Annapamu, and it's going to really hurt my f walking traffic, and so I better buttress my website, and I need a person who can run this. And mm -hmm. then also we have this, you know, this issue around um, who is going to maintain this database that was this new tool in the business. And so I had those sk those skills in spades, and Frank asked me three questions during the interview about art history. Mm -hmm. And you knew it. I gave A plus answers because of because you were studying. Because I got very lucky. Because he could have. There were so many gaping holes in my knowledge. But he just happened to ask the right questions, the exact right questions. And I look like a very knowledgeable person. I, I'm, as I said, I gave the A plus answer. So he hired me on the spot. And honest, honestly, uh, began mentoring me and told me I was the future of the business very soon after I started. So that was very exciting mm -hmm. because it was kind of, it felt like a purpose. Mm hmm. So gradually, I started to sell things. I think I sold my first painting like three. I'd been working for the business for three weeks. And Frank, now, were you selling the paintings that he found and the artists that he found? Okay. Yeah. So you know, we had this cafe. So Frank would go to lunch. Mm -hmm. He always had the same table, and he would have guests pretty much every single working day for lunch. That was part of his. Um, strategy for different artists or people that knew art or just he would have clients he would have artists mm -hmm. it was one of the best things going in santa barbara was how fun yeah frank's table and he could see right down the center of the the gallery so he could always see who was coming in so anyway he was at lunch and we had a show on the wall and a couple came in and they bought a painting by an artist we show named robin gowan and after I he got back from lunch, I said I sold a painting, and he said, "Oh, that doesn't 
usually happen. Uh huh. But you were you were in a different function back then. I was sitting in a little hovel at a desk working doing computer stuff. Doing computer stuff. That's so funny. And so, one of the things about that is because I didn't have an exhaustive art history background. People would come in and ask questions for the bookstore side, mm -hmm. and I was mortified every time I didn't know an answer. Mm -hmm. And so just kind of like a substitute teacher, if somebody asked me a question and I didn't know the answer, I would, that night I would go home and I would read about that artist. Mm -hmm. And then they couldn't catch me on that exact question the next time. Mm -hmm. Well, after 22 years, you start to know a few things. If you mm -hmm. just follow that process, people keep bringing new projects to us, mm -hmm. new artists, and eventually you start to even connect some of those dots. So at this point, somebody will bring somebody in. It's like, I don't know that person, but I know a lot of the people that they know. Mm -hmm. And I, I have some context for what we're looking at. Yeah. Is it a lot of networking? I mean, how do people, how do you find the artists? What's the life of an artist like? Are they hustling to try to get their art into a gallery? What's... Uh, that's a really interesting question. And I would encourage you to talk to artists. Um, yeah, which I will, but I was just curious yeah, your, your yeah. perspective on it. I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. I, I can tell you I've worked around artists for a long time. Sullivan Goss is, for better or for worse, we're the largest, best entrenched space in town. And we're right across the street from the art museum. And so... We're the big game in a small town. Yeah, I was thinking that you you were one of the, I don't know, uh, maybe you, maybe one in Montecito that I'm thinking of? Yeah, there's Caldwell Snyder in Montecito, and they, they have a very similar kind of um, profile in the art world to Sullivan Goss, but they are recently arrived from San Francisco, where which is their base. Mm-hmm. And they're actually renting a space that we used to occupy. When mm -hmm. I started in the business, we also had a space in Montecito, the Caldwell Snyder space, in yeah. fact. So, yeah, I mean, uh, they probably sell as much work as a gallery as we do, but I don't know if they sell as much out of Montecito as we do. The, the big dynamic in Santa Barbara that I always tell people about is it's an international city and people come here from all over. Where are you from? Originally from, I guess, LA area, Long Beach. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm from Washington, D.C. My son is from Santa Barbara, and mm -hmm. but you very rarely meet people who are, you know, of age who are from Santa Barbara. And that's going to be a whole other podcast. We're going to talk to them. Yeah. I think that's a really cool thing. So, you know, it's an international city, but it's also this very small town. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, the trick is to figure out when to have the sort of approach and manners of an international city person and when to have the manners and approach of a small town person. Mm -hmm. And what I will say is we're, we're trying to show people who are well established in Santa yes. Barbara. We don't. We haven't done a ton Wait, of... you mean the artists or to the well-established? The artists are pretty well-established. Okay. Yeah, one of the things about our model is we have to be able to charge enough money to make that business work where it is. Mm -hmm. And that means, and our clients tend to be fairly value conscious. Mm -hmm. That's a really strong imperative in Santa Barbara retail. There's a lot of money here, but it's it's not flashy and 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 it's not ostentatious and mm -hmm. so it's a little bit conservative in terms of how how people spend and so what that means is i have to have people who already have a track record of showing and selling mm -hmm. and what we can do is give them an upgrade and and grow them if they're very local we can make them regional if they're regional we can make them national mm -hmm. my aspiration is to be the kind of gallery that can take somebody national international mm -hmm. and i'm 48 years old so we'll see if i can get there before by the time i'm ready to hang it up yeah so are you always searching for up and coming artists that you think have a lot of potential for yeah, I well, what I want is to be in love. Mm -hmm. I am very excited and I'm more effective as a 
in all candor as a salesperson when I'm genuinely in love with the piece. Yeah. And with the, with that artist in general. Mm -hmm. So I'm always searching for people that I think represent quality. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody can see quality if they'll just commit to looking. I have this made up number. It's a hundred thousand things. If you look at a hundred thousand things, you start to have a pretty clear idea of like, what's, what's, the through line of quality. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. I mean, some people come in, they see a piece of art and they're like, I don't get it. I can do that at home. That happens a lot, right? It does. It does. So what is the difference? Like, let's say there is a piece, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. And somebody makes that comment. What do you see that other people don't see? Well, I mean, in some ways... You know, simple ideas that are effective are pretty much the hardest ideas in human life to come up with. Um, So that's one part of the equation is that simple is hard. But the other thing that I would say is a lot of times people will say that about things that are more modern and or contemporary. So they were made, let's say, between 1910 and today. Mm -hmm. And That market, that idea, the whole notion of modern art is that we are trying to innovate and break boundaries and make new things. Mm -hmm. Well, once you splatter paint on a canvas like Jackson Pollock did, Mm -hmm. everybody can splatter paint on a canvas. But But, the fact that he did it first? uh, Yes, he actually he didn't, but you know uh, that's the commonly held story. So let's just go with that because uh, people understand that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, well, what happened to the person who did it first? Well, he was a very interesting LA artist named Nude Merrill, and um, Jackson Pollock. His brother lived in Los Angeles. He had a big connection to Los yeah. Angeles, and sometimes it's about who you know. I think he may have seen Nude Merrill's paintings. Nude mm-hmm. was Nude was connected to some international collectors down there, named Walter and Louise Ehrensberg, and they're very, very, very famous in art history. Most people don't know that they lived in L.A. on Wilshire Boulevard because their collection today is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Mm-hmm. So it didn't even stay in California, but it was very influential down there. And people from all over the world would come and see these two. They had very, very, very significant things in their house. And they had a whole social circle. So Nude Nude was a you know Danish artist, and he was responding to the most advanced art ideas on planet Earth in his generation. And he made these paintings he called fluxes, flux paintings. And they were like Pollocks, basically. But there was no market in Los Angeles. Nobody was looking at them. Nobody was interested except maybe Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. And... So, you know, um, innovation is a big deal. And then star power, Jackson Pollock, you know, was on the cover of Life magazine mm-hmm. when Life magazine was a big deal. And was that before he did the art or af- after? After, okay. Yeah. But, he, okay. he, I mean, you know, the other thing that people don't sort of sometimes see about these guys is that a lot of the early moderns like Jackson Pollock really – had traditional skills and they were just very interested in doing something new. There was a huge focus on you're never going to paint skin better than the French academic artists of 1890. You just aren't, Mm -hmm. you're never going to paint hair better than them. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, is what are we going to do? And once you have those French artists who are sort of, the Impressionists and Manet, mm-hmm. there gets to be this like, let's let's just do something that's new. Yeah. And the thing is, that idea of trying to break new um, ideas open, I think is very connected to kind of the American idea of, you know, pioneering. There's a whole mythos mm-hmm. of, right? And so it really caught hold in the American imagination, and it's still something that's going on today. An interesting question is, what's the place of mastery? Are are we still too focused on innovation, or should we also be talking about, okay, 
you know, can you do this excellently? Mm -hmm. And we, as a gallery, we're presenting a whole story about art history. So we have those tightly rendered 1800s paintings mm -hmm. and we have very high level contemporary realists and we have mid-century abstractions and I'm not wedded to one particular thing or another but I do think that when you spend more than a few thousand dollars on a work of art you're entitled to a story that resonates with you and maybe that goes back to my love of literature mm -hmm. now are you guys only American art Officially, yes. Unofficially, we sometimes handle things out of the back room that are mm -hmm. not strictly American. It does get us out of some thorny issues in the art world, European art. If it's before World War II, you have a whole issue of ownership chain because there was a lot mm -hmm. of yeah. Nazi looting of things, and it's, that's an issue. And and then there's also the issue of expertise and people who work with me, we all know a lot about American art history at this point because everybody's been there for at least 15 years. Mm -hmm. But I only know so much about, you know, I know the top 20 French artists, let's say, and the top 15 mm -hmm. German artists of, mm -hmm. let's say, the 20th century. Um, I, I, but If you're talking about somebody who studied with one of those people and was really good, I may not know them from a hole in the wall. I can look them up, but I don't have native expertise. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how do you find these artists? Like, how do they end up in as, as an exhibition at, at your gallery? Well, the art world is an ecosystem. And so very frequently... They're already showing somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was this one guy we did, a, eventually did a solo show for. It was really actually an emerging artist. And I saw his first shop or show at a tattoo shop on okay. Mesa. Oh, really? Yep. Who was it? His name was Zach Paul. Okay. And mm -hmm. he was from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. And he was a really wonderful, amazing constructivist kind of geometric artist and uh, now lives in LA. But anyway, yeah, I mean, I've, I've picked up one of our, my favorite artists that we show is a woman named Maria Rendon and Maria had a piece in a big juried invitational show at Westmont. Mm -hmm. So and, do you go to all these different, like, do you go to different exhibitions or art shows? I do. I don't go to as many at this point in my life as I would like to mm -hmm. because I have a nine and a half year old and I'm really yeah. focused on being a dad. But mm -hmm. when I was younger, yeah, I was out more often. And there are places where artists congregate. Elsie's is one of the. You're kidding. Is one of the. Are very, you serious? Is one of the very <laughs> cool places where all of the bohemian creative types have every single one has had a few or more nights at Elsie's. Is it still there? Of course. Okay, I haven't been there. And Oh, you haven't I've been heard, there? At, I've heard about it. Yeah. I mean, it's... So you meet people there? Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's always... The art world is not enormous. It's really big. I don't know all the artists in Santa Barbara even, but it's not... It's not unconquerable. Mm -hmm. Recently, there was a show at UCSB. They have an art museum as well called Pooch about a beloved local figure named Keith Puccinelli. I knew Keith Puccinelli at the end of his life. He died early of cancer, unfortunately. But he was really involved. He and his wife were really involved with starting what is now called the Museum of Contemporary Art, Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. It's originally called the Contemporary Arts Forum. And Fran had a gallery. His wife, Fran, had a gallery. And they were all part of this new hip contemporary art contingent in Santa Barbara in the 80s and 90s and aughts. Mm -hmm. And so he had this big show. And there had to be five, six hundred people there that evening. And I knew at least a third, probably like a half of them. Mm. And so if you hang out, I, one of the best ways for young artists who want to learn how to break into the gallery system is start going to exhibition openings. Mm -hmm. Don't be pushy, but just go and be a familiar face. Mm -hmm. And then 
you know, show wherever you can and let leave breadcrumbs and eventually dealers will figure out, oh, you're you're one of us. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real community effort, I think. It sounds like there's a big art community here. The Santa Barbara really supports the arts and it's a very creative hub. Is that what you see in Santa Barbara compared to other towns? So promise you will steal the soapbox from me because I have a real passion for telling this story. I'm not positive as I sit here, but I believe that Santa Barbara is the second oldest art scene in American California. So after 1850, when America, when California becomes an American state, the first art scene is San Francisco. Yeah. Nobody can doubt that. And their first art school is the oldest art school west of the Mississippi. So it's a, it's a big city for American art as a national endeavor. Mm -hmm. The next city is either Carmel or Santa Barbara. And I, it's down to months to mm. be fair, but I think it's Santa Barbara. I don't think it's Carmel. And almost nobody who lives here knows that. Mm. Every time I tell people that they're kind of shocked. And why do you think that? I, it's very interesting. In 1920, Santa Barbara considered itself an art colony. Mm -hmm. And today it does not. Hmm. And it seems like it to me, actually. There's so many different forms of art here. Right. Well, the history of the community is we're, we're recording here not a quarter mile from Stern's Wharf, which is a deep water pier. And it was built in 1872. And it was for a very long time the only place that you could load goods in from the ocean in all of Central California between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And our first artist gets here in 1875 and he sets up between Stern's Wharf on State Street and the first luxury hotel, which was called the Arlington Hotel. We might have to take a little break here. Sounds great. If you can hold that thought. Okay, so welcome back. So we, as you were saying about Santa Barbara being a port city. Yeah, so I think that's part of why we're an international city is because for a long time we really were a place of that you could get goods here. The first artist gets here very early. The next artist doesn't arrive. And he's, that guy's by the name, by the way, was Henry Chapman Ford. And he went down in art history for a lot of reasons. He was the first professional landscape painter of Chicago. Mm. He was an early president of the forerunner of the Art Institute of Chicago. And in California, he became the first man to draw and make prints of all 21 missions of the California chain. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. And so adopting that cultural history was an artist's choice. And then it became a dominant choice for Santa Barbara. And mm -hmm. that has been a model now for all of California. So you can see the evidence for this theory around you, but it's just not a story that people tell anymore. We've had two schools dedicated to art. We had the, a place called the Santa Barbara School of the Arts, which is by a Zaytun restaurant. Okay. Have you been to Zaytun? Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a little complex back inside there that... Is that where that theater is? Yes, that was okay. part of the School of the Arts, the Alacoma okay. Theater. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then later in the late 60s and early 70s, there was something that eventually became known as the Santa Barbara Art Institute. Mm -hmm. And then we also had Brooks, which was a photography school. Yeah. So it's like, oh, well, there's nothing going on here. But we have had three dedicated art schools. And then also Santa Barbara City College formed an art program pretty early on. And UCSB formed an art program pretty early on. And, and there's tons of art classes. What is that, you know, when you're painting the landscape, what's that called? The, what kind of? Plein air? Yes. That's yeah, yeah, plein air is. Very popular here. It is the dominant tradition historically. The, the, the It's a French term and it means out, open air, outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically... When you have oil paint in a tube, you can take your paints outside and you can squeeze a little bit onto a palette and you're not mixing powdered color, powdered pigment with oil, which would be a disaster outside because the wind could blow all of your blue into the grass. Mm -hmm. So once you get oil paint in a tube, you know, the French artists start painting outside. It is an enormously big deal in California. And it was a big deal in Santa Barbara from about... 1902 to about 1930. Mm. 
And there were people even after that because it was such a dominant tradition. But actually, Santa Barbara did the thing that the rest of the art world did. It 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 experimented with all different modern styles, and mm-hmm. we had abstract painters and etc. And then in 1960, a guy named Ray Strong came to Santa Barbara, and he was hired to paint the backdrops to the dioramas at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Oh, yeah. Have you ever been there? Um, Somebody I know who's been on the podcast, his father painted an Indian scene because he used to go out to the backcountry and try to identify all the petroglyphs. Oh, we might have to take a little... Here we go again. I live by the train. (laughs) (laughs) That's so exciting. Yeah, so I don't recall specific art at the Mm -hmm. Natural History History Museum, but yeah, I I do know what you're talking about. If you go there again, Uh pay special attention because some of those people are really famous. Huh. So Santa Barbara, you know, is that that plein air style, Ray came here for that reason. He helped start the Santa Barbara Art Institute. And then in 1986, he and um, a whole bunch of other plein air painters started something called the Oak Group, mm-hmm. the Outdoor Air Club, club with a K for some reason. Mm-hmm. And they were inspired by the French artists who circled around Pizarro, who's a, a important French Impressionist. So these guys get together and they have two shows a year. And one of the shows is about preserving open space landscapes. Which is an important topic here. Critically important. And you would have to credit the Oak Group with really drawing attention to it. Mm. And when I started with Sullivan Goss in 2002, you could not sell anything hardly that wasn't a plein air landscape Mm -hmm. because the Oak Group was massively successful in all these artists built really wonderful careers and the mm-hmm. locals bought these paintings in droves. Mm-hmm. And that story drove a larger story even in California. The The oldest plein air art club in California is something called the California Art Club. And on their website, they say, you know, we started in 1909. It was a big deal. We kind of went a little quiet in 1940 because there wasn't as much interest in our form of art. But we restarted in 1990, and and some of the reasons that we did were the Oak Group of Santa Barbara, Mm. who showed that there was a resurging interest. And much of my career has been tracking the revival of interest in both older California painting Mm. and also, you know, plein air art specifically. Mm. Um, Ray was, he was almost too good to be true. He, He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He didn't swear. Mm -hmm. He was ceaselessly kind. He was a pacifist. He was down to earth, but he was quite sophisticated. And when when was this again? The day. So Ray came in 1960. He died in 2006. He was 101 years old when he died. Did you get a chance to meet him? I did. I knew him pretty well, and eventually we did a book on him. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that book came out in 2016, and literally every institution in the county of Mm. that shows paintings did something for Mm. that. The Santa Barbara Museum of Art, the Maritime Museum, the Trust for Historic Preservation, the Santa Barbara Historical Museum, the Elverhoy up in um, Lang, uh, the Wildling also Mm -hmm. in that area. Everybody did a show. And that's because Ray was passionate about teaching people that it was good to get outside. Mm -hmm. It was good to explore your creative side. And Mm -hmm. it was good to set aside wild space. Yeah. And those are still colossal virtues. And now it's like I've seen in the last 10 years some really wealthy people make absolutely mind-boggling gifts financial gifts to institutions to set aside land Hmm. like hundred million dollar plus gifts just to buy a piece of california and say leave it as it is yeah so that people can know you Mm -hmm. know why this is such a special place yeah and i really think the art worlds can claim some credit for that they they kind Mm -hmm. of created this conversation and ultimately 
part of what art does is it drives cultural conversation, mm -hmm. not just paintings and drawings and sculptures, but movies, books, podcasts. Yeah. You're talking about what is it that, who are we? What's mm -hmm. important to us? Mm -hmm. Where do we want to be going? Yeah, they're cultural statements. Exactly. Yeah. And then we all sort of talk about them. Mm -hmm. Is this who we are? Is this who we want to be? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Santa Barbara's gone through this great shift recently. Yeah. And I, I guess you've seen that too. Yeah, we are talking about that earlier. Yep. And so the question is, how big a shift is it? And are and we how going... how do we maintain what makes Santa Barbara so special? Exactly. Yeah. And and a lot of it is this, you know, the Ray Strong ethos of be incredible, but be modest. Yeah. Orient yourself towards things like mm -hmm. health and the environment and your fellow human beings. Yep. And you will enjoy a better quality of life than anything you can buy. Oh, yeah. And then there's a lot of money here, so you can also buy the stuff. But that's not what really drives the quality <laughs> of life. That's so funny. So, yeah. Well, not everybody has a lot of money. Well, that's very true. And one of the things about Santa Barbara, of course, is it's very, very difficult to sustain, you know, just shelter here for most people. Well, you have to be creative and you can't be lazy. <laughs> there's that. And, and... You know, the other thing is, is that uh, there are still people who are really plugged in this town who are living kind of the sweet life for no money. Mm -hmm. I remember we show a painter named Hank Pitcher who teaches out at the university. He's been there for 50 some years and is sort of a beloved icon here in the community. And Hank gets to paint some very cool places that I'm not even allowed to talk about. Mm -hmm. But one of them, we put a painting in a book and it's this little shack and for just decades this kind of hippie surfer lived out there and he was living on the beach oh i know it oh, with know. land around him and when he left the next people who lived there and they don't live there anymore so i'm just going to say their names but it was brad pitt and jennifer anderson so oh, okay. it was like yeah. that level of property right that would attract people who are very famous looking for total seclusion, have all the money they need to spend. And their predecessor was this hippie surfer. That's so funny. Right. So there's yeah. a lot of those stories in Santa Barbara, I find. There are some people who have been here for a very long time, mm -hmm. and their cost basis is not what people who are just getting here pay. Yeah. And so they have a different time. I think those of yeah. us who have, you know, are more recent transplants we're the ones who have to kind of figure out, okay, how is this going to work? Or you, yeah, or you can just be lucky. <laughs> That's also a way to go. When I I lived in your neighborhood, and you and I have talked about that as well, and I lived in a house that had been occupied by all kinds of important artists at different periods in its history, including Diego Rivera. For what, what? Yeah. Go back. What'd you say? And Diego Rivera painted his self-portrait that's on the 500 peso note uh, a quarter block from where we're broadcasting. What? Where? In Chapala Street. You're kidding. He I'm painted not, there? He painted there. Does Cassandra know? She put it in the article in Santa Barbara oh. Magazine. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I'm relentless at picking up those little factoids. I have like a... Really? Almost an autistic brain for... Those little tiny tidbits. They Wait, just. Did Frida come too? I don't think so. And that's so sad. My dog is named Frida. And so I would have, that would have been my heart's delight. Yeah. Um, ironically, we, we didn't know about Diego's short but meaningful tenancy in that, in the room where we lived. But we did name one of our houseplants Diego because we so love Diego and Frida and that yeah. whole story. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, when when I got a chance to live in that building, it was because I was just walking in this neighborhood and it was empty. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, luck is a big deal to do with it. And then the man who owned the building at that time, I think he really wanted to knock this historic building down and turn it into condos. And he was in the wrong town for that. We have the oldest architectural preservation laws in the United States in Santa Barbara. So mm -hmm. it's like, don't mess with our... It's, yeah. You know, the, the working theory of Santa Barbara is it's perfect. Don't mess with it. And so the trick well, is how can we improve it and, 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 and innovate and 
make changes that don't hurt the quality of life. And that's the biggest conversation that goes on every year in Santa Barbara is how can we change it and not make it worse? Did you hear about what's going on behind the mission? Tell me about that. Some LA developers purchased the seminary that's right behind Mm -hmm. the mission. And they're trying to develop an eight-story tall apartment building with 463 parking spaces right next to mission. The state of California passed a law. You know, they're trying to Mm -hmm. make more housing available. That is a really interesting question and sort of like an immovable object and an unstoppable force. I don't know how that's going to happen, but I am very, very, very skeptical that they will get eight stories because we have height limits now in downtown. I will state right out front that I don't know. But yeah, that's that's an example where I think everybody in Santa Barbara would say that is going to lower our quality of life. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a story going back that kind of touches on there used to be a place, a whole city block owned by one family. And today that's the Alice Keck mm-hmm. Park Memorial Garden. And that uh, that property was owned by the Herder family and they were very, very fabulous interior designers and made tapestries. And Albert Herder's murals are in the public library and he was a teacher at the Santa Barbara School of the Arts. Anyway, it was a fabulous property with cottages and this really beautiful mansion, all surrounding gardens, and the herders would have people from back east in the Midwest come and stay with them. And they, you know, they, they eventually went the way of all things. And a guy wanted, he bought the property and he wanted to build a a high rise. Mm -hmm. And... He owned her cottages and her home and that whole city block. And the city fought him tooth and nail and said, you can't do that. That's a really historically important property. Yeah. It burned down in the middle of the night. Oh, gee, I wonder how. (laughs) (laughs) But you and I walk past the Alice Keck Park Memorial Garden. We don't Mm -hmm. walk past a high rise. Mm -hmm. So um, even where um, mysterious arson is concerned, the community of Santa Barbara is very intent on quality of life. That is the overriding prerogative in in, in our community. And the big disagreement is about what's going to make for quality of life, right? Mm -hmm. So is cheaper housing gonna be the key? And I think it's inarguable that some of that is necessary. You were talking about how Mm -hmm. hard it is for young creative people to be here Mm -hmm. because of the cost. But is it an eight story building behind- The mission? Right next to the mission. The queen of missions. The only mission (laughs) in California history that's always been a church. The mission that was, you know, our mission is probably the most iconic mission in California history. It's There's 10,000 images at the archive library there Mm -hmm. of just our mission. So, I, I hear you and about what I don't know, but, oh, wow. It would be really quite a feat to defeat the whole community on this issue because people love that neighborhood too, don't they? Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So So, just on on a closing, any artists, you know, emerging artists that you showed at at the gallery and- Well, the big thing I would tell everybody about is we have a show every December. It was born in the Great Recession called The 100 Grand Show. And if you want to find out about Santa Barbara art scene, come see The 100 Grand Show. It's 100 works of art for $1,000 or less mm-hmm. each mm. by usually about 98, 99 local artists. Mm-hmm. And it, the local art critic, Joseph Woodard, said it is the unofficial salon of Santa Barbara. So if you want to figure out what's bubbling up, mm-hmm. Just come see the 100 Grand Show. And it's it's as inexpensive as we can make art. I mm-hmm. Art's kind of expensive. But it it's a wonderful show, and you get a really great overview of everybody who's coming up. You know, we, we're producing legions between UCSB and Westmont and Santa Barbara City College and just the people who come here. Mm-hmm. There are new exciting things happening every yeah. week. How, what percentage of the art in, at the gallery is local artists versus? Oh, that's a good question. I don't have a. I don't have a. I don't have a percentage, but 
A big part of our formula has always been take the strongest, best established local stuff that we can. We don't have 100% of all the strong local artists, Mm -hmm. but the best people that we we can make space for, et cetera, in context with people who are important to the history of California, in context with the people who are important in the history of the United States. And that enables us to grow the local artists by showing them alongside these people who are better known. Mm -hmm. And, but also um, what I find is that the locals really care about the locals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thanks for being on. Kathy, it's lovely to meet you. Yeah, it was great. It was so uh, interesting and informative. (laughs) Thanks, Kathy. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Please stop by and say hi to Jeremy at Selvin Goss Gallery. They're located at 11 East Anapamu in Santa Barbara. And please remember to subscribe to this podcast so you can get notifications of new episodes and share it with those you care about. Thanks again. Mm-hmm.